Um, good morning to everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, for the next half an hour, um, I'll talk through what we think is a, a particularly exciting time in our kind of healthcare story. And what I find really interesting is when we started this discussion just a few weeks ago, and uh, it was kind of a time when we put metaverse front and center, but increasingly over the last you know six weeks, maybe a little bit longer, it feels like the axis has shifted. And while metaverse is still quite dominant, um, obviously things like generative AI have taken over the conversation in, in, in really interesting ways. So I thought I'd just broaden this out a little bit and say um, it's metaverse and other emerging technologies. And we'll talk a little bit about the story of healthcare that um, that might uh, um, you know become apparent to us over the next decade or so. And I absolutely honestly feel that this is truly the decade of healthcare. Healthcare in 2020 and healthcare in 2030 will be such poles apart that they will be completely you know, unrecognizable to each other. So um, without further ado, let me just jump into that. I'll start with a bit of introduction. Uh, my name is Ved. I lead our um, innovation work at Tata Consultancy Services. Um, I get to work with uh, a, you know, a bunch of industries from uh, not just healthcare, but automotive and manufacturing and, and retail and banking. And I um, work with a uh, incredibly diverse team of designers, developers, and we work in a very technology agnostic manner to just solve problems. Um, and and we, earlier this year, I was uh, fortunate, enough, fortunate enough to be able to publish my first book around digital, and I and I write an innovation blog on a weekly basis. Uh, just to complete the story, I live in St. Albans with my family. I play football on the weekends, and to my neighbor's great consternation, uh, I, I play the saxophone once in a while in my non-existent spare time. But more importantly, my day job, which I, uh, I absolutely love, is uh, also involves setting up uh, our Paceport Labs, which is a space we are constructing in London to host uh, our clients and to really drive innovation conversations forward. And, and we think this happens best in a way that is truly um, ecosystem oriented, which means it's not industry specific, uh, you know, increasingly in the kind of problem spaces, especially things like healthcare, we see the confluence of multiple industries having a massive impact. So with that, let me just jump in. And what I'd like to do first is to step back into time a little bit, because I think it's really important to kind of paint a story of how we got to this point. And I'm going to take you back a few years, um, probably before any of our times, uh, specifically about 13,000 years ago. Um, and I think the what, what I particularly want to highlight is the journey that we've made specifically in healthcare. And so if you go back all that while, what you'll see is that the world was very different. And when we uh, you know, we're talking about a time when human beings were essentially roaming tribes, right? And the and the anthropologist Margaret Mead says that the first sign of civilization was actually the the discovery of a of a femur bone that had healed, and that this meant that somebody had been cared for instead of just being left to die when you know such an injury occurred, and so the birth of civilization is kind of the birth of healthcare as well. But from that point on, and and for the longest time in that history, um, I think we lived uh, as you know great believers in the fact that health was something that was decided by gods and and all kinds of external things that we just didn't understand, and largely occult religious um, versions of healthcare, often influenced by witch doctors uh, and and you know god men or god women, and and that's how. For the longest time, health was addressed um, until we got to about, you know, 400 BC when Hippocrates um, arrived on the scene and he kind of obviously reshaped how we think about health, uh, and he brought in rational thinking into healthcare for the first time ever. And at that point, the story changes to cause and effect. Um, but we lived with the cause and effect version for about another 300 years, and um, we then we then see the arrival of Galen. Uh, and Gallen is a, 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 a kind of a scientist who, for the first time, looks at the the um, what happens inside the body. Um, and up to that point, even for the Greeks, dissection and and cutting people open was considered, you know, anathema. It was it was not it was not accepted. But Gallen went on to create these kind of drawings of what might be happening inside the body. Uh, he also conducted lots of experiments on animals. He was the first person who postulated that the heart had four chambers, um, but he also had a lot of 
you know, contrary beliefs that we would find strange today. He he was among the first to postulate that the that we are ultimately driven by four humors, that our body is driven by these aqueous humor, vitreous humor, and depending on what kind of humor dominates, you are that kind of personality. So if your bile dominates, then you're a very bitter person and so on and so forth. Um, but Galen's world then, you know, um, led to, uh, you know, we're talking at this time about the Dark Ages, lots of conquest and empire building, but not much by way of science, until you get to the Renaissance, and the Enlightenment, and then you get people like Paracelsus. And Paracelsus is really important because he brings chemistry into healthcare. And he's the first person who starts to look at what the sum of the salts and the compounds might be that are driving our bodies and behaviors. He's among the first people to also coin the word zinc. Uh, and, and there are other um, elements that he has named. So you now have kind of from clinical biology into the into the stepping of um, stepping into chemistry. And then uh, a few years later, you get Pasteur who comes up with the, the idea of germs. And what's interesting is that each of these discoveries sometimes is accompanied by the underlying capabilities, for example, the evolution of microscopes that allow us to actually view germs for the first time. So we now are into the world of microbes. And then you get to Rontgen and physics, and, and now we're able to see the construction of the body. We're able to see breaks in bones. We're able to see through um, the physics of the human body. Um, and now we've kind of come from biology to chemistry to physics and all the way through to Watson and Crick on the, again, on the back of work done on crystallography by Rosalind Franklin into the world of information. And this is really fundamental because the world we live in today is this informational view of healthcare. Um, and, and this has led us to a point where we are today on the cusp of these amazing things where we are starting to look at, um, ectopic organs or, or artificial uh, organs that can replace your natural ones. You're looking at the, con, you know, the fusion of man and machine in, in interesting and, and sometimes worrying ways, but who knows, we, we, we are on the verge of creating cyborgs. Um, and so this is where we've reached at, you know, in the story of healthcare to this point. And if you look at this timeline, it, it's, it's quite a long timeline and it's obviously not drawn to scale. But what's interesting is the pace of change you'll see has started picking up uh, in the context of the broader timeline. But even there, it's not that long ago, give or take 150 years, that we sincerely believe that the right way to cure diseases was to bloodlet. And we the bloodletting was done by sticking leeches on your body and, and letting them suck the blood out. So that's, you know, it wasn't that far back. And the other thing that I think is fascinating is the story of people like Semmelweis, and there's now a play about him on West End. So if you know the story, he was the first person who said we should be washing our hands between operations and dramatically reduced the mortality rate in a hospital in Vienna. But then he was laughed out uh, of his job and, and had a very unfortunate end because no one believed him. And it's a reminder that change isn't easy. You know, despite all the technology advances, the things that stand out to me in the story are Number one, that at every stage we have been dramatically wrong about how we think the world operates, how we think healthcare works, how we think the human body operates. But on the plus side, we've also been able to, you know, doctors through the ages have done their best to treat and cure patients. And this is both sides of the idea of scientific thinking, that we act on available information, we don't get paralyzed, but also we have this model of strong opinions loosely held, which means we believe strongly enough to act on it, but we're willing to change our position when faced with new data. And that is particularly interesting as we step forward into a world where increasingly the kind of data we're getting might challenge a lot of our kind of our, our deeply held beliefs. So this world we're in today, which is the datafication, and I use the word because the first industrial revolution is said to have been all about, you know, motorizing and electrification, and now really what we're doing across the world is we're datafying the world. And healthcare is being datafied in a number of ways, and, and now we're stepping into the future. And I'd like to present to you the simple structure of how we think this is happening, which is we're getting new data, we are being able to capture it better, we are doing it at lower cost, and once we are able to do all of that on the, on the right-hand side, we can visualize better, we can process better, we can predict better. And, and on the right side, I think these are almost superpowers that we just didn't have before. So examples of that, um, just to walk through a few, the the idea of new data, um, you know, might seem strange in you know two thousand years um, after, uh, you know, Hippocrates uh, and and so on. But you know, in the world today, for example, if we, if you look at the, what's happening in gut bacteria, 
the idea that a huge amount of our health information at an individual personalized level is actually captured in our gut bacteria and now we can mine that information is is reasonably recent uh, and the power of that is immense you know, I, one of our colleagues in tcs uh, dr sharmila mande has a uh, a paper that uh, has been peer reviewed and published in Nature magazine, which for the first time is able to predict preterm births for pregnant women in the first trimester. This is the world first. And this data comes from analyzing gut bacteria. And every other day you see kind of stories about how the gut bacteria is being used to, you know, um, create new insights into individual health patterns. So that's that's just one example of the different kinds of new data we're talking about. The next thing is our ability to capture data better. Uh, and I'll I'll use an example here of uh, this company I met recently, uh, which is called Head Technologies. Now, this is all about um, eye movements. Your retina actually vibrates at a, at a very, very tiny level. It's a few microns. And that vibration is normal. It happens all the time. But variations in vibration so if the vibration is lower than normal, if it's dulled, it could be a sim, you know, a sign of early onset Parkinson's. Now, doctors have kind of known this, but it was really hard to uh, actually measure this because of the size of, of the vibration being so small, because it's in the eye and it's hard to capture. And so it was particularly invasive. You had to put people under anesthesia and actually put something on the eyeball to track it. With this device that you see in this picture, you can actually do it in seconds. You can just point the gun. It, it just bounces a, 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 a ray off your eyeball. You barely feel anything. And in seconds, you get a sense of what the change or what the level of vibration is. So our ability to capture data is dramatically improved. And, and this is a big thing. Uh, on the subject of Parkinson's, just uh, yesterday there was an article about how smartwatches can um, give you data that will indicate some of the earliest signs of Parkinson about three to five years before you can actually medically capture it in the current um, you know, traditional ways. And so these are big deals, right? Um, you, you're also seeing the movement of data capture going from these heavy duty industrial hospital based machines to lightweight handheld, almost mobile devices. Uh, there, is a, there is a point of care ultrasound which is produced by a company called Butterfly, and now GE and Philips have versions of this. Really, it's saying you don't have to go to the hospital. You can do it at home. Ideally, a nurse can do it at home. Uh, I spoke to someone who uh, is a practicing nurse, and she said that she could use this uh, and, and really come to a patient's house and see if a baby is breached, or she said that she was in a scenario where she was able to use this device, and sometimes as a nurse, she doesn't, she doesn't know what the problem is, but she knows something is wrong because she can see something unnatural in the image. Um, and there are plenty of examples like this. Uh, I, I know a company that does a, a mobile phone based consumer grade ECG device. So you strap something on and, and it'll give you your heart pattern. Now, this is not currently not clinical, but it's it's very popular amongst runners, for example, because it will tell you if there's a problem, it picks up and then you can take it to the doctor and have that investigated. So that blurring of you know, even even kind of quasi clinical devices, but actually quite a few uh, devices that are actually clinical grade, but are also handheld and at low cost and can be deployed at scale. And this is you know, obviously incredibly important in many parts of the world where infrastructure is a problem or distance is a problem. So you've got this on the left hand side, the, the evolution of data capture. Um, and on the right hand side is where we get into what I call the superpowers, and the first of which obviously is where we started. This this conversation started with metaverse, and really the whole area of metaverse, augmented reality, virtual reality, that whole bundle of what we call extended reality uh, is, is really, really powerful when you want to visualize better. And visualizing better is important because what you know, what every doctor is really doing uh, is they're assessing, they're continuously trying to analyze uh, what is a very complex and fast changing environment inside your body and maybe making calls about surgery. Um, uh, one example that uh, comes up to my mind is there has been this case of, uh, I think there's a Brazilian doctor who has performed a series of fairly uh, complex surgeries to separate conjoined twins. Um, there, was a, there was a particular example of conjoined twins who were born with their heads were joined together. Um, and it was, I think the surgery was a few hours long, but leading up to the surgery, the doctors were able to use um, virtual reality to, to walk through any number of scenarios, uh, look at a, 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 you know numerous 3D images of, of those twins and be able to almost perform the surgery 
um, in practice before they actually got to the real example. And what we're also seeing is doctors being able to invite other doctors in a form of telepresence method into a surgical environment so they can give their real time inputs by looking at the same data. They're not on a phone call somewhere being told what's going on. They're actually seeing what you're seeing. So this, this shared visualization of the world, the shared visual, visualization of real things, of things that are, are not even visible to the real, uh, to the naked eye, or the visualization of abstractions is particularly powerful. Um, and, and in healthcare, there is a whole slew of things that are coming through as we speak. Um, for example, right now, you've got things like, um, you know, use of virtual reality for mental health. Um, and, and people are discovering that certain aspects of virtual reality have the same effect as, um, you know, taking psychedelic substances, which are also have, you know, been found to have medicinal benefits. Uh, you're seeing virtual reality in pain management and therapy. We're seeing that in, uh, in diagnostics. So that's one side of things. But as we step forward, not just the delivery of healthcare, but the management of healthcare. So creating digital twins of hospitals or, um, you know, creating digital twins of uh, other uh, aspects of uh, healthcare and then visualizing them in this way will be incredibly important. And on the topic of uh, digital twins um, is um, where I will step into the next piece, which is really all about um, how we um, not just visualize, but process. So if you wanted to do real-time work on, on, obviously, healthcare is complex and sometimes things are changing very quickly. So the example here is a company that I met again in Ireland called Synchrofy. Um, and what you have here is um, this idea that in a hospital environment, the, there are if a patient might be being tracked by five or six or ten devices, depending on the severity of their conditions. Um, sometimes, even for a regular childbirth, you have you know multiple devices that are strapped up. And what Synchrofy does is it assesses from multiple devices to create a single task list for a, a nurse to say this is the sequence in which you should perform. Because when you've got multiple patients in a ward, multiple devices, it can be really complex to figure out how that risk profile of each patient is changing. Uh, and, and it's unfair to leave that on to a nurse who's also being interrupted every few minutes by the next crisis. So in these kinds of environments, we are seeing the ability to process data efficiently as the next big thing. Um, and this is not, you know, it's ironically not true just of healthcare, but healthcare is a much a particularly uh, significant scenario because the cost of failure is very high, but in any high operating environment, um, you know, high changing operating environment, these kinds of tools are becoming very popular. So Synchrofy is an example which has been tried by a few hospitals. Uh, in, it's it's incredibly successful because, you know, the, the uh, you know, from the couple of hospitals that have tried it, the ROI is like in in three months, you, you're, you've recovered your investment. So real time processing of complex data uh, in, in these kinds of fast changing environments is, is uh, the next piece. And then in order to predict based on all this data that we've gathered is where we step into the world of digital twins. And, and obviously we are now seeing the emergence of digital twins in pretty much every aspect of healthcare. Again, I'll, I'll refer to one of my colleagues who's built, uh, this is Dr. Bina Rai, who has built a digital twin of, of the skin. And what that does is it allows us to model an individual skin so that maybe you can customize um, both um, medicine as well as cosmetics to a particular skin type. So it would be act, it would act faster on your skin um, at initially on your type of skin, but ultimately it is it is designed for specifically your skin so that, you know, if it's a if it's an ointment that is being designed with uh, nanotechnologies, it can be faster acting or more eff efficient in the way it acts on you. So if you look at this model, you know, I've just tried to summarize everything that's going on in a single um, picture, but it's 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 hugely unfair to the, the vast range of changes that are going on as we speak, because each of these is actually exploding as we speak. And I'll just talk through maybe two or three examples of, of um, how we see that happening. So the first of them is um, um, an example I've picked up from Galvani, which is a, 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 it's a joint venture between a Google company, uh, an Alphabet company, technically, and GSK. And what I find really exciting about Galvani is that it takes a completely different view of, of how we treat uh, illnesses, specifically long-term conditions. Because the going back to our timeline, even now, the bulk of medicine is essentially you know, biochemical. We test chemicals, we, we formulate drugs, 
and we try and minimize the side effects because they will go into your bloodstream and they will actually reach all parts of your body, but we will minimize the side effects so we can focus on the thing that it is trying to fix. And Galvani takes a completely different approach and, and it takes a bioelectronic approach. And basically it says we try and address the signaling system between your brain and your organ. So if, you, if it's a diabetes scenario, then the uh, what it tries to do is it stimulates your pancreas by um, by kind of tracking the pancreas performance and then it mimics your brain signal to the pancreas and it gives it a bit of a nudge to produce more insulin. So it is trying to kind of augment the, again, going back to our point on information, it is actually addressing the information system of the body and the signaling system through which your body might perform better and kind of um, self treat it's uh, it's malfunctioning when it's a long term condition like diabetes. Of course, each of these will bring new challenges. You know, what if this is hacked, or or what are what are some of the challenges? But you know, progress, as they say, is just having better problems to solve. So, so you know, we'll be here debating some of these things, um, and I'm sure there'll be other ethical aspects of a lot of these new ways of treating things. But I think from a scientific perspective, this is really really interesting. The next example I wanted to share with you is, of course, you know, where we get to step into genomics. Um, we are now, uh, thanks to you know, companies like uh, OpenAI, uh, DeepMind, and others, we're able to, you know, predict um, the 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 behavior of individual genes and the way proteins fold uh, and the way genes behave, and and that leads us to the ability to solve, you know, diseases that simply were beyond reach of of um, medicine, such as cancer and and many others that are being addressed now at a genetic level. Uh, this also will have its own ethical challenges because the next step for this, of course, is to say, can we can we remove that gene from the family tree? So can I can I when my children are born, can I um, genetically, you know, remove that that particular strand of DNA? Uh, and this has been done in China, as you know. So so leading to a lot of questions about what is the ethicality of this. But again, the fact that we can do this means that the, the future potentially is, is very bright in terms of being able to address some of this, some of the problems that we are currently unable to. In all of this, we shouldn't forget that the very basic thing of just being able to visualize the patient in ways that, that go beyond the 2D x-rays or, or, or any kind of 2D picture into this world where we can actually walk around this 3D image. I can strip away layers and layers of you know, muscle and tissue and bone, and actually see what's going on. I can, I can in great detail take a 3D image of what's going on inside this particular human being, and and review it, and I can share it with experts. And three of us can be looking at this picture together, sitting in different parts of the world. You know, that itself is enormous. Um, and and at the heart of it, and I would say almost as a very basic layer, that's what the metaverse should allow us to do. But the metaverse isn't just about the visualization layer, of course, and we can have a long debate about what the metaverse is. But we, I'm, of course, using this in, in the context of a set of technologies that will extend reality in a number of different ways. Um, but you could argue that it has a combination of telepresence, but some people will also kind of would like to include things like blockchain, um, et cetera, as part of the metaverse. I'm not going there, and that's a whole different conversation. I'm simply looking at, when we say metaverse, I'm talking about the ability to create these virtual realities um, and, and improve three-dimensional shared space imaging models. Um, but on that point of data and, and things like blockchain, I think it's worthwhile just ending on this um, uh, in terms of these snapshots. The story of data ownership, which is the, which is another massive battleground. I know there are parts of the world. Um, Ireland is a good example where you simply can't get your own healthcare data. You have to you have to apply through freedom of information request to get hold of your own healthcare. This has been a debate in the UK as well. Uh, and so the picture you have on your right here is the um, is from the DHI who are working on, you know, what does a patient centric data structure look like? How can we enable uh, ownership of data by patients? Um, it still begs the question, which I don't think we have the answers to necessarily about, are patients ready to accept that? I mean, today, if you gave me all my healthcare data, would I be able to look after it? You know, am I, are we equipped to handle the few gigs of our own healthcare data from our from our birth till now? So there are all these unanswered questions, but I think the the principle that we should manage our own data is a given, and so we're trying to figure out ways in which we can make that happen. On the left, the picture is one of the ways in which people are trying to do that, and, and that's a blockchain-based 
uh, model by a company called BIOS, which is B10S. And what they're doing is their premise is that you should have this uh, on your phone, uh, a permission based uh, self sovereign data model that allows you to access your healthcare and share it with whoever you choose to. And where this becomes really interesting, I think, is um, the, the, the excellent use case of when you travel. Because then you're outside your domestic healthcare system. You might be super, you know, really well looked after by by a you know a super NHS doctor or a set of doctors or the system. But what happens when you travel outside the country? And if you if you fall sick, then how is your data going to be accessed? If there is an emergency, would you be able to share your you know critical data, your blood type, your allergies, all of that? So this is the model that these guys are trying to look at, where on a on a permission basis, you could say for the next 24 hours, I will share my data with this hospital or anyone in these in this region, and that allows, you know, in the case of an accident, for you to be looked after um, and cared for without having to guesswork uh, around what might be a blood type or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So these kinds of things are um, really uh, important as they're evolving. Um, but I think the this core construct of data ownership is going to be one of the biggest battlegrounds in in this space for a while. Uh, and and just to end with, I will uh, give you a you know um, a picture of where we think some of the challenges are. Right, um, there is a there is a um, you know, huge problem of change. We talked about um, Semmelweis, but reality is that today healthcare is a particularly complex, multi-stakeholder environment, uh, and some of my colleagues. Um, I, there's a, I was speaking to uh, Jeanette Hughes from the DHI in Scotland, uh, and they've published some work which says sometimes change can take, you know, I think that figure was 17 years to, to play through a system. So change in healthcare is not easy. There are too many uh, stakeholders. It's a complex system. You know, hospitals are still very dangerous environments. People, people die in hospitals because of what they pick up in the hospital. So we're still working on how to make hospitals safer. Um, we know that there is still a huge resource imbalance. We, we still have, you know, issues around uh, resource allocation and basic pay issues, and, and we have strikes by doctors. Um, we are still hit by black swan events, and we're all very familiar with this. And, and I love this that recently, um, I think I heard the former Surgeon General of the U.S. talk about this. That even today, healthcare is still seen as a very reactive system. Uh, we we go to the doctor when we fall sick. And he said this is the equivalent of us navigating a dark road by just bumping into things and then discovering we have a problem. Whereas really it sh it it should be, you know, significantly more predictive. Um, and the point has been made in multiple horizons and multiple forums that we today have more sensors uh, and we look after our cars much more diligently than we look after our bodies. Um, ironically, even though most parts in the car are, and the car itself is replaceable and our body is not, Nonetheless, we treat our bodies very badly um, compared to a lot of our other possessions in the way we try and predict problems and we solve them before they occur. And so the picture of healthcare that we're also seeing emerge is that healthcare is not about absence of illness. It's a, There's a general wellness and the number of factors that go into the general wellness are many. There are social, economic factors. We know that life expectancy varies dramatically by education, for example. So, so this is a very complex set of challenges we're going to have to live with. and and. You know, just to highlight that metaverse, although it will make a big difference, is only a part of the solution. Our team has been working on a specific problem of aging, um, and and we think this is a interesting one because this is where everything we've spoken about spoken about comes together. Um, and so, you know, it is that kind of focal point of all the problems we've spoken about because the bulk of your healthcare challenges will be faced in your in the last twenty years of your life. The bulk of healthcare costs will occur in the last ten percent of your life. So everything we've spoken about is relevant to, to the problem of healthy aging. Um, it's also not just a healthcare problem, it's a massive financial problem because as, as countries age, we're seeing a shift in productivity, in shift in the overall economic performance of the of, of societies and countries because of the balance between working age and non-working age people and how we're going to manage that. We are seeing the emergence of smart homes and communities becoming incredibly important at actually solving this problem because in many parts of Europe, we're simply lacking the resources to look after the number of older people, especially those living alone. And so connecting up homes, connecting up societies and going back to the point of data and how we use that to solve for this is going to be really important. And lastly, it's, it is a wicked problem. It will take multiple stakeholders. We know that, if, for example, in the UK, you've got 
you know, social care and health care. And it's only now that these integrated care boards in the NHS are starting to pull those together and create common views of that. We still don't have care records. We have health records in, being implemented in some areas, but care records are a thing of the future. But today, if you are elderly and living alone, and if you decide to shift home, a lot of your care information is lost because there is no digital record of that. So, so hopefully at some point of time, you'll also get a care record, which will be a backbone for all the care that is being provided so that you know your health and your and your wellness will be captured in a single span. And, and hopefully that's when a lot of this will come to life and fruition. I'm going to stop there um, because you know we could keep talking. I hope I've given you a glimpse of both the technology aspects of it, but also some of the systemic changes and a couple of areas where you know this really um, you know the, the rubber meets the road, so to say. And and I'd be happy to take any questions. But at this point of time, I'm going to stop and hand back to Jim.